Hello, 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 and welcome to It's All Good. I am your host, Latavia, and I want to welcome you and thank you for listening. Um, If you are new here, this is a podcast where I, Latavia, the host, uh, just take some time to share my experiences, my journey through adulthood. I can't say that I'm an expert uh, per se because I am, and every day is a new day, every day is a new adventure. And I don't know, say for some of my, I would say my more seasoned uh, advisors or or people who are experts or people that I would consider experts on this thing called adulting, um, we all are uh, experts in different ways. But I say all that to say, welcome during this podcast. Today, I will share a new aspect of adulting um, in my life and each episode it's either me sharing my experiences or I'll have a guest who shares their experiences and perspective on adulting Um, and the way that I like to start all of my episodes is with a gratitude moment because one of the things that I have learned that help me get through each day in this journey that is adulting is to you know find and spend some time to reflect on something or someone that I am grateful for. And today, and really these last few weeks, ever since it's been announced, one of the things that I am grateful for is that there is finally a black woman who has been nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, and the confirmation hearings are, are happening as I speak. I ha- actually have it playing in the background on mute and I'll say that this I'm grateful for many reasons and I think I shared this before but if you didn't hear that episode one of the things like I said I'm grateful for the fact that although I feel like it's long overdue in 2022 we have our first uh black woman who has been nominated to the supreme court and her name is Katanji Jackson Brown like you can't really get much blacker than that um, I love her name. I love the fact that she has sister locks. And although I admittedly did not know anything about her prior to her nomination, all the things that I have learned and I continue to learn, I'm loving. And I am a, I will say she has my full support. And I'm grateful for it because I remember when I was younger and first started learning about laws and the civil rights movement or even just the judicial system and kind of having that first thought of oh hey I want to be an attorney thankfully there were there was some level of representation um in the sense of at that point Thurgood Marshall as well as Clarence Thomas were already Supreme Court justices that I remember initially wanting well like yeah I want to be like Thurgood Marshall I no longer want to be a judge. I have learned what goes into that. Um, But I say all that to say, at that time, I don't remember there being any visible or like notable, noticeable representation of black women in law outside of what I saw on television. You know, I love Claire Huxtable. I love Maxine Shaw, attorney at law. Um, So those were like my first examples of women as attorneys or Um, but it wasn't until later that I even, you know, was able to see or meet a black woman who was a judge and to see where that was, you know, that was possible. That was realistic. Obviously, once I got to law school, I was fortunate enough to see and meet quite a few, uh, black women who were attorneys as well as judges and just in various, I would say, administrative positions but that is I'm talking about from the first time I really started thinking about it which was around eight or nine to law school which I was 22 21 22 when I started law school so that's a big gap um and so I like I said I'm grateful for this in the sense that there are little girls now they know about her they will get to see her um yes we've come a long way in terms of representation on television as well as in real world in real life but this is it's the supreme court like this is the highest court in our country so i am grateful for myself to even as an adult i get to see someone who legitimately looks like me she got brown skin like me her hair is like mine uh but that she is 
poised to take a position or take a seat on the highest court in our country. Now, as I mentioned, the confirmation hearings are going on. And let me preface this by saying, yes, I am an attorney. I did take con law, but I am not a constitutional law scholar. I am not the one that just took great pleasure and joy during that class. I did it. I knew what I needed to do. I knew what I needed to know to pass the class as well as law school. And I know my basic fundamental rights. And I think that we all should. But as I mentioned, you know, this part of this adulting journey is I'll be honest, I've not ever in my adult life sat through and watched any significant amount of a confirmation hearing or proceedings for Supreme Court justice. This is truly the first time that I have taken an active or been intentional about watching and, and learning and educating myself on that. And so like I said, hey, admittedly, there's had a bit of a bias in, in, in doing this. But nonetheless, this is a new step for me in the sense of making sure that I am educating myself and not just blindly following or blindly supporting someone. So I encourage those of you watching or listening, um, for one, if you hadn't heard about it, now you know, there is a new nominee for the Supreme Court because uh, Justice Stephen Breyer announced uh, earlier this year that he was retiring and as he is stepping down because if you don't know the Supreme Court it is one of the three branches of government we have your federal legislative and judicial the Supreme Court is the third branch it's supposed to be it is a, it serves as a part of the checks and balances of our government of our democracies kind of the way and so the Supreme Court makes decisions about various aspects of law and when they make a decision in most cases, it, it becomes law. It becomes the rule. And so it's a big deal. And in the history of the Supreme Court, there have been two black people on the court. Both were male, Thurgood Marshall, as well as Clarence Thomas, who at the moment, I believe, is, I think he's been released from the hospital, but he is sick. So not sure what's going on with him health-wise there. But I digress. Uh, this is something that... I think as adults, we need to be aware of our government, our judicial system, about things that are going on with us locally as well as nationally. And I understand for most of us day to day, what is happening in these uh, proceedings does not necessarily have any bearing on our day to day lives. Like, hey, I'm, I'm at work. I can't watch this or I got too many things going on and I'm just trying to I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to make sure I do my job, pay my bills, take care of my family, children, take care of me, whatever the case may be. Trust me, I completely understand it. And this is in no way me trying to condemn or judge anyone. Like I said, this is my first time really listening or paying attention. Um, but I think as adults, <laughs> at various stages, this is a part of it, of taking uh, taking responsibility of what is going, just knowing what's going on around us. And yes, for the most part, what happens within the Senate does not have any, it may not have a direct or immediate effect on your life and, and what you do, but it does affect us. Um, because for one, we elect our senators and uh, representatives. So, Yes, it feels like, oh, that's too much. I don't like the process, but hey, it's still important. And where that comes into play with these current hearings is uh, part of the confirmation process is the Senate Judiciary or Judicial Committee holds the hearing. So it's it's not necessary. It's kind of like a trial, like unofficially, but essentially. So the first day it was more introductions and all of the different members of the committee got a chance to say their piece, so to speak, uh, kind of an opening statement of, hey, congratulations, these are my concerns, this is what I'm looking forward to hearing from you. The second day is literally like a 12-hour hearing where the entire day, it's each senator on the committee, I believe there are 22, are get 30 minutes today, and I think they get 20 minutes, well, 
the first day, well, the first day of the actual hearing where they're asking questions, I think they get 30 minutes. The second day they get 20 minutes each. And so it's each one during that time frame, they get a chance to ask the questions uh, of Judge of Judge Brown Jackson um, and she has to answer. So she's essentially on trial all day having to answer. And the point of this is to, on one hand, and because as much as it, I wish it was not, it is still a political process because as I mentioned, the Supreme Court is one arm of our government. And so it's the job of the Senate to confirm, you know, essentially to assess and make sure that this nominee is one qualified and that they will be impartial and not bring politics into their decisions on the Supreme Court, which saying that out loud is, yeah, that sounds good. But I know that that's not the case all the time, especially in recent years uh, with the more recent nominees that were the nominees that were appointed by President Trump. Uh, this whole thing has become political. But I digress. So the point is for them to essentially just to assess. And one of the things that has come up, and I, 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 I assumed it would, was this question or allegation that Judge uh, Brown Jackson is not qualified. Uh, even so much, some have gone to the extent of they want to see copies of her LSAT score. And if you're not familiar, the LSAT is somewhat, I guess you could equate it to an SAT or ACT uh, it's an interesting exam that if you're going to law school that you have to take. And I think it's for the birds. I really think they need to get rid of it because I don't, where I do see some connections between law school and practicing and the LSAT, I don't think it's a true determining factor of what, of whether one can, can be successful in law school and whether or not someone would be a good attorney or not because... I know people who had real high scores that are not practicing and who had low scores and who are or who were in the middle, <laughs> yours truly. But it's just ridiculous. And it's one of the things that when I first heard about the nomination that I said, hey, I'm excited. This is great. Like, this is historical. There's so many wonderful things. I know foolishness is coming. And I was like, I'll address that when it comes. And so now we are in that moment. It's been happening in the week since the announcement was made, um, but it's this constant questioning of whether or not she's qualified. And now it's, and for the most part, it is Repub It is the Republican senators who are kind of taking this approach and making it more of a partisan thing of uh, there's different, essentially what they're doing is going through her entire history her career really um she was a federal public defender she served on the u.s sentencing commission she's been a federal district district court judge and she's now uh on the appellate court of uh, her d district uh, dc district or in washington dc area and for one she would be if confirmed she'd be the first and only uh, supreme court justice to have ever served as a public defender and while, and if you remember when I had uh, uh, Vivian, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Vivian Williams on, she talked about just kind of the, the bad rap that public defenders get. And we were talking more so on the state level, but there are also public defenders on the federal level because that right to counsel applies across the board, whether it's a state level offense or a federal offense. So it's, to me, Aside from all of her other just amazing qualifications, I think that unique one is significant because the recent nominees had little to no um, trial experience, let alone experience as judges. She has had experience as a trial lawyer, as a policymaker on the sentencing commission, and uh, for the last nine years, she has been working or serving as a judge. And I'm trying to find someone I know posted um, this statistic or this kind of chart because people, like I said, it keeps coming up of, oh, she's not qualified or is she qualified and questioning. And 
I can't, it just, this whole, that notion of specifically for black people, I heard it growing up um, that you have to be twice as good to get half as much. And it's, like I said, that notion that, that this is even a thing. And so I, I want to read some from this graphic of just where it's saying, oh, my eyes. So in terms of education, she went to Harvard for undergrad and law school. She has, she clerked for three Supreme Court justices, uh, Justice Breyer being one of them, that is the justice who is planning to retire, whose seat she would, re she would fill if confirmed. As I mentioned, she was a public defender. She has also worked in private practice and she was a, a district court judge as well as now she's a a judge on the court of appeals in in the dc district and so with that with the her current position and the two previous ones where she was on the sentence u.s sentencing commission and the uh as a district uh, federal district court judge she had to be confirmed through senate so she has been through this process three other times and I believe two of those times she received bipartisan support, which essentially means Republicans and Democrats both voted for her when she became, uh, when she was confirmed for the Court of Appeals, it was not, she did not receive uh, the support of Republicans. And that was just last year. So what I can say is, not even can say, I would say to me watching this process and watching her in these proceedings is proof to me that God, what's for you is for you and God puts people where they're supposed to be and he will not put more on you than you can bear because what I know is having someone go through, scrutinize and question my career decisions or things that I thought that I wrote when I was in school, in law school, because one of the, uh, senators were asking her about something in a note that she wrote about so if you think about papers you wrote in high school or in an undergrad or grad school whatever the case that you're 10 15 years removed from somebody's now coming back and questioning okay well this is what you were advocating for then do you still feel that way now or why did you feel that way then uh, or just even how the political game is being played within the, these hearings and as much as it's been said that they're not going to do what was done to Justice Kavanaugh or Justice Barrett during their confirmation hearings in terms of bringing in their personal lives and calling into question all of these things, they're doing it in what I like, you know, they're doing it in a backdoor way. Um, for example, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham was asking her, uh, judge jackson questions about her family and beliefs her religious beliefs and essentially asking and may just went on this spiel that really had nothing to do with judge jackson but he said all these things to then come around basically to say yeah so all of this stuff was done to justice barrett because they were questioning whether or not because she goes to church all the time will she be able to be impartial uh, when a case comes before her of someone who has a different belief. Well, yeah, you're right. That shouldn't have anything to do with it. And I don't doubt that you can make that distinction. And it just, it didn't make sense. <laughs> One thing that, like I said, I just, I'm, I'm learning to love and appreciate about Judge Jackson is as she is having to sit <laughs> at this table and listen and just take it all in, she is very poised. She's just very calm. Um, and I can tell you, you're clearly, you're experienced. You're an experienced judge because you know how to sit and receive the information, process it, take the notes that you need to take, and then respond accordingly. But I also love <laughs> that as, I would say as poised and professional as she is, you can read in the body language when where she can also detect BS because during specifically during Senator Graham and like I said I have not listened to all or the you know all of the uh the hearing I still gotta work um 
the parts that I've caught when there are senators who are asking questions or kind of going down a line of questioning that really makes no sense or it does not have anything to do with, you know, the facts. Uh, she just kind of gives the look of like, hmm, oh, okay, all right. And I love that she is able to essentially bring them back to the point. Okay, you just said A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but we were talking about L. So I acknowledge what you said, however, let me answer the question. And so it's, what I say is, there's no doubt to me that just, if we look on paper, education, career, she's more than qualified. Um, she, and then how she is handling herself, how she is managing the questions. And you know, even the sense of, as much as it's not, you don't want your judges or the Supreme Court specifically to play a part or be political, this process is political. And you have to choose your words carefully. And so she is careful in terms of how she's responding, what she's responding to, how she's responding to, making sure if it's something where it seems like they're trying to do a gotcha type of thing that she's not letting them trip her up. And one of the things that I've noticed too that keeps coming up, uh, specifically from the Republicans, uh, is that while she was a district court judge, there were several cases, they brought up several cases um, involving child pornography and essentially where the sentence that she gave differed or was less than the sentencing guidelines as well as lower than what the prosecutors requested and trying to essentially push this narrative that she's soft on crime or that she's soft on uh, sex offenders or child pornography uh, offenders, which once again, I don't know her whole case history. I don't have the time, nor am I interested in kind of going back through every single case, but that is what they have done. And one of the things that she has pointed out, as well as some of even the other senators on the committee have come back around to say is, hey, each case was different. She looked at the facts that were presented, all of the evidence, um, taking each case on its own, taking the defendants and the different factors into consideration and the sentences that were given were reasonable. Um, and that it essentially just, hey, y'all are, are reaching. You're trying to find a reason to call her judgment into question, trying to imply that she's associated with some of these far, far left, you know, essentially trying to put her in a box that she's not in. Um, and I, and I know there's some that they're, there's still a disappointment or a frustration that the other candidates weren't selected, that she was the one selected. You have some people who are still in their feelings about the fact that President Biden said he was going to nominate a black woman and then did it. Um, you know, trying to throw out the afford, uh, affirmative action card and all of these different types of things, which if you are a black person or a person of color, or I would say other minority that has been living in America any length of time, you've heard all of these things that, you know, if we get a position, especially if something of, of prominence or power, then, the, oh, well, are they actually qualified? Did they, oh, somebody just gave this to them. You got it because you're black. Like, I've heard things like this most of my life, um, which, as far as I know, I have not received anything or benefited from something specifically because of affirmative action. If anything, I know, aside from the favor of God, because um, favor is not fair, I have worked for all the things that I've gotten. And yes, I have, and I'm, I'm grateful that I have been uh, blessed and privileged to, to do some things that there are people in my family who have not. And so it has allowed me to get into a position to understand and see things differently. But I know that nothing's been handed to me and just like I'm 99.9% .9 sure nothing was handed to Judge Katanji Jackson Brown or Brown Jackson throughout her career. And if there was ever anyone who was qualified 
and well suited to be a Supreme Court justice. It is her. And I say that color and race, race and gender aside, because I'm almost certain if she were a white man, there would be no question. Or even if, you know, it was, oh, she's, they were a Republican or they're a Democrat, aside from the partisan politics that have come into play and seem to be involved in every decision that is made in Washington, D.C. Now, aside from that, there would be no question. If whether there were nobody would question whether or not she was qualified, nobody would care about what her LSAT scores were. They were, I don't think, the scrutiny that is being paid to the different types of decisions um, that she has made, or even the groups that have supported her or that have been played a role in this entire process, it, it would not be the same. Um, and that's just it, it is what it is because at the end of the day, this is America, and the fact that she is a black woman adds on like three levels of scrutiny that she would not have had. Uh, but I say all that to say I am, I have gotten very invested in this process. Like I said, there is a personal interest. I no longer have a desire to be on the Supreme court or even to be a judge, to be honest at this point. But I know the value of having having women as judges, having black people, black women as judges, just black people in the courtroom in positions of authority. I know the impact that it has and I know the importance of being able to see people in this position, even if you don't want to do it, to know that it's possible, especially, you know, for her, she's family, her parents were educators and then her dad her dad then went on to to become an attorney but it's just like it's not like she came from a family that was wealthy or full of money it's humble beginnings public servants my dad was in the military my mom has been an educator most of my life uh, most of my family have done something some version of public service or are in helping professions and so it's like, I can relate to her on multiple levels. And I feel like she can be relatable to people who aren't even black, um, to, to young boys, like to those people who are starting from humble beginnings, who don't have, you know, they don't have family members where they can benefit from nepotism or a network of people. And so it's, and like I said, I did not do that much digging into previous justices um but what I can say just in in thinking of where we are as a country right now the climate um as a culture just for so many reasons there I think she's she's beyond qualified she's more than capable and I honestly believe she she might have been born for this because it's just the way that she is handling the scrutiny the questioning just all of this this entire process and it's not even over yet the way that she's handling it it's just with so much grace i i love it especially because i'm someone that you know the lord is still working on me and my facial expressions and reactions because oftentimes my face will react before my brain has a chance to tell it like no and I love just watching that. Even like I said, her responses are, are great in the way she's handling herself. But just even that part, especially knowing, and I'm you know I'm sure she's she's fully aware of this, and I think um, any black woman is of how we're watched and scrutinized and just day to day things. Because if something happens, even if you're wronged and you react, uh, you raise your voice, if or even if the tone of your voice changes. You, your head starts moving. I talk with my hands a lot. So just all of those different things that I know that she's aware of and on a much larger scale because in essence, the world is watching because there's, I know there are people in other countries that, that, that watch things that happen here in the States. But I say kudos and congratulations to you, Judge uh, Brown Jackson. I think this is well-deserved. I am hopeful and I believe that there you know that there won't be an issue any further issues I do believe that she will be confirmed and that she will be the next 
justice on the Supreme Court. Um, because if we do take it back to the political aspect and the partisan thing, the Democrats have the numbers to uh, where they, even if Republicans did not vote for her, the Democrats do have enough votes to confirm her without uh, the Republicans. Of course, it would be great if it was done, you know, from a bipartisan standpoint. Either way, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, the conclusion of these hearings that she is confirmed and will become the next Supreme Court Justice of the United States. And as much as I don't like always reading opinions, I actually look forward to reading uh, an opinion where she is involved. I'm, I'm sure she may not, you know, be the she will, will not be the highest ranking member, so it will take some time, but I, I do look forward to hearing more about her and just how, um, as they've talked about her being a consensus builder, just how, what that looks like uh, with her on the Supreme Court and, and the hopeful shift of even just the fact that there will be four women on the Supreme Court. That's the most there's ever been. So there's just so many good things. Like I said, so I'm just happy. I'm happy that I am able uh, to, you know, that I'm alive for this, that I get to see this and that I get to, and I'm, I'm able to understand the process because I might have been alive during Clarence Thomas's, uh, hearing, but I certainly didn't understand nor really know what was going on at the time. Um, but like I said, I'm, I'm grateful for her. I'm grateful for as messed up as this country can be sometimes I am grateful to you know to have been born in this country and to be a part of this process and so as I mentioned uh Judge Jackson comes from humble beginnings and I don't know even the half of what she went through um in terms of just pushing through and pursuing her dreams and pursuing this career and now as a wife a mother balancing all of these things I like I say I tip my hat to her and I just say this to you listening and or watching as a reminder that, hey, it's a part of your, it's a journey. This thing we call, you know, life we're living, this adulting, as much as I be wanting to send it back and cancel my subscription, <laughs> I acknowledge I am an adult and I'm here. And even though it does not look like it or feel like it, and on days that you're ready to just give up and be done, remember that this is temporary this is a part of the process you might be in a valley moment right now but your mountain the mountaintop moment is coming so just keep pushing through and know that in the end it is all working together for your good thank you for listening and until next time <laughs>